If Reality Check Radio enriches your day in life, support us to keep bringing you the content, voices, perspectives, and the dose of reality you won't get anywhere else. Visit www.realitycheck.radio forward slash donate. Last time Banksy was on the show, it was very, very popular. Heaps of comments. So I'm going to catch up with him about what has been going on since we last spoke in November and what he thinks are the important issues that we should focus on for the future of our nation. Banksy is back and he's on the line now. Welcome back to The Crunch, John Banks. We, we last spoke on the 9th of November just after the election and you were very ebullient uh, back then about the the coalition government and what we were going to, to get. Uh, are you still happy with what you um, saw at the election? Uh, happy, happy is not an operative word that I would use in this confluence. Um, quietly confident, uh, slightly optimistic, um, thinking it through carefully and hopeful are the three words that I would use. So <clears throat> I went to Wellington on invitation from some of the young backbenchers and I listened to their maiden speeches. Uh, for two days, I spoke yep. to the ACT Party Cork, and I listened to many maiden speeches. And I left Wellington uh, the following afternoon um, quietly pleased and uh, relatively optimistic about the country's future. But let's back up the bus, Whale. Yeah. We had the worst administration in history uh, ruling over us subjects uh, like there was no tomorrow. Uh, these were bad people, this Ardern Labor government, very bad people. I'll give you 150 billion reasons why they were bad people. The debt went, our overseas debt went from 50 billion to 165 billion in six years, and we've got nothing to show for it. That's why I'm very angry about this last Labor government, and I'm glad the people of New Zealand, uh, the boiled frogs, woke mm. up to the fact before it was too late uh, that their time had to be over for the sake of the future of the country. So when I came out of Wellington after sitting in the parliament for the first time in 10 years, on the floor of the parliament, listening intently to the maiden speeches from the ACT Party and from the National Party, I came away optimistic. All in lower case, please, if you don't mind, Whale. <laughs> yeah, but you must have been quite pleased because when you were the ACT Party leader... You were the one who brought in charter schools, and those are back on the table now. Well, they, should, they should, shouldn't just be back on the table. We should be opening the first charter school again uh, the day after Easter in five days' time because in Wangarei, where we had a charter school, where it was mostly young Maori boys who had failed, yeah. they had a 98% success rate in NCEA Level 1. And down the road at Wangarei Boys High School, with the same young Maori boys, they had a 40% success rate. So charter schools work. These charter schools we had were working. Uh, it was an act of sacrilege that the Labor Party got rid of them, and I can't wait to see them reopen. You've got a personal thing about charter schools too, though, don't you? Because one of your boys went to a charter school. Yes, my boy Alex uh, wasn't doing so well at uh, a very prestigious school, uh, costing me $60,000 a year. Uh, so uh, not that it was a money-saving exercise, but that was one of the upsides of taking him out of this prestigious school, uh, which is one of the worst schools in New Zealand, by the way, um, and, putting him into, and putting him into a charter school on the North Shore, the military academy. It yeah. turned him around. He popped class and he went into the army and the rest is, uh, uh, is uh, history. Uh, it turned him around. It's not for everyone, whale, but no. there are so many kids failing the system that don't need to fail. And, and I guess that's why you know, the government we've got now is one that appears to celebrate success rather than have a pity party on failure. Well, I, I'm pleased about that. I, I need to tell you, I quite like Lux. Yeah. I think Lux is doing Okay. He's doing okay. It's a struggle for him every day, but he's doing okay. Uh, Mr. Luxon um, is giving it his best shot, and uh, he's a good man uh, from a good family. 
with good values, good principles, concepts, philosophies. And he will do quite well if he lets himself be Lux, be himself. Don't try and be Cam Wallace, the failed chairman uh, of Air New Zealand, the useless fellow that ran Media Works. Don't try and be Sir John Key, who was the ultimate street politician, airport politician, yeah. uh, very, very good at retail politics. Don't try and mimic these people. Lux needs to just be Lux, and he will do very well. That, that's one thing I've noticed with him is he appears rehearsed and contrived, and it's not the natural person that he is. And I, I, I always say this to politicians um, you know, when they ask me for advice. I said, just be yourself. Don't try and be someone else. And that's exactly what you're saying as well. Don't try and out John Key, John Key. You can't do it. Uh, don't try and, and and be all things to all people. Everyone um, becomes disappointed. Find your own well, self I... and portray that and portray your values, and then you there will not be a disconnect with, to, between what people are seeing and what they're hearing. Come across as a good man who cares. Mm. He can easily come across as a good man by standing beside his wife yeah. because she is a tower of strength to him. Uh, and um, she is, you know, a tribute to wives, uh, to mothers, and to women. And, uh, you know, he just needs to reflect in her quiet glory, get on with life, be humble, stay true to your principles, true to your philosophy, true to any concept you have about uh, governance and the future of New Zealand, tell it as it is, and just get on with the job. And speaking of getting on with the job, I see that the media have, uh, in conjunction with their pals in the in the Labour Party and the Green Party, have started a campaign to try and get rid of Nicola Willis before she's even delivered a budget um, promising tax cuts. Um, you've got you know that snivelling little communist uh, Simon Wilson at the Herald going on about we need to have um, you know more taxes. It, all of these left wing media people. And uh, and and the Labor Party think that the answer is more taxes, and they really don't want tax cuts. Um, and so they're trying to, you know, Bryce Edwards even put out a thing yesterday saying that Nicola Willis should resign because she hasn't delivered tax cuts. Well, she hasn't even had the budget yet. So, you know, the, the well, government's got well, it up against them, haven't they, with the media and these sniveling well, little let's lefties? Get some, let's get some perspective about this. Who gives a shit what <laughs> Simon Wilson has got to say. Uh, who cares less what Brian uh, Wilkinson or whatever his name is, Bryce Jones. Bryce Edwards. Who, 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 Bryce Edwards. Bryce Edwards. Who gives that mind time? Sensible people like us <clears throat> and your listeners don't give it mind time. We don't read the crap narrated in the New Zealand Herald every day. One, we can't afford to buy the Herald. I certainly can't. And secondly, why would I? Why would I convolute my mind and my way of life and my healthy well-being by reading shit like that every morning. <laughs> oh, exactly. I, I'm always staggered that there seems to be a very, very large number of budgerigar fanciers that buy the Herald to line the, the, the cage of their budgies. I mean, I can't see any other reason why you'd want to – I mean, it's not very absorbent. Uh, it's okay for budgies. You wouldn't want to put it in a, in a kitty litter tray. Um, to line the bottom of that. It would just, you know, go right through. So I'm, I'm staggered that well, there's so many budgie fanciers out there that want to buy the Herald. Well, just a minute, Well, I'm an animal rights activist and have been all of my life, mm. and this is insulting and demeaning to animals. So let's move on. Now, coming <laughs> back to the green story, I sat in the parliament next to Jerry, and I was sitting in the seat where former MPs could sit, and I was watching from the left-hand side of the parliament, across the parliament, to the maiden speeches of the ACT members and national members, I looked down the rows of the Labour Party benches mm. and the Green Party benches, and I've never seen so many losers and so many drop kicks assembled in one place at one time. It was awful. So, while I don't give mine time uh, to what thieves 
formerly members of the Labour Party have to say as they rob stores around town, or grandstanding MPs that represent me in Parliament, local MPs that are irrelevant. So I don't, I don't deal in the politics of irrelevancy, but I want to come back to something that's on the horizon, hasn't yet been eliminated, yep. like Hamas, the terrorist group mm. in Gaza, they need to be eliminated. The, 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 the Green Party, in terms of what they stand for and what they stand against in the algorithm of the future of this country, are irrelevant, are irrelevant, and we mustn't give them mind time. So I was very happy to see MediaWorks go broke. Very happy. I think, the, that was I think a most of the country stuff. did. You know, when that news broke, um, you know, I, I think it was about eleven o'clock on a on a Wednesday. I was on a ferry to to Waiheke, you know, catching some public transport for once in my life, and um, everybody was looking at their phones, and there was this buzz of excitement, uh, you know, at the at the premise that News Hub was going to cease to. Uh, be indoctrinating us on on our TV screens, and everyone was thinking, "Well, why are they waiting till June? Can't they just go now?" Well, the day they hired that Cam Wallace, formerly uh, a steward for Air New Zealand, uh, as boss of Media Works, was the day that the final nails will be put into the coffin of that media company. Now, it's not to say that some of the people there were good people, some in the minority, some were good people. Most were woke, weak, pathetic puppets of the bosses. That's what they were. And they were singing from the song, left Marxist song sheet in tune, together, on message, in volume, every day. So I'm glad that they have been gone, they have been eliminated, and they're out of the algorithm. And so I don't mind a responsible, uh, a responsible fourth estate, but I can't stand these pious, uh, platitudinal gooses that parade themselves as unbiased and peddle their Marxist crap every day of the week and funded by me. Funded by me, a hard-working taxpayers. Funded by your listeners, hard-working taxpayers going about their business today. The fourth estate substantially in New Zealand has been funded by the taxpayers, and the taxpayers have had a bad, bad deal. And we've had enough. And that's the thing, isn't it? Like, when, when we saw during the pandemic, we didn't get any critical questioning of government decisions. We got uh, a rah-rah team... Uh, applauding everything Ardern did as she trampled on our rights and and our uh, privileges as as Kiwis, uh, you know, locking citizens out of the country, locking p- healthy people up in their houses, um, you know, and then we saw, of course, the dreadful uh, uh, way that they crushed the protest in Wellington, uh, and the media were all there cheering on the government as they did that. I mean, if it was a if it was a centre right government. They would have been marching in the streets with the people opposing the government, but no, because well, it was Ardern, they were cheering her on. Well, I don't want to spend too much time talking about her. Uh, it really lowers my self-esteem. <laughs> and I could get to fail after this uh, interview with you that I can't actually drive my car. <laughs> well, I just you... feel so depressed. And so I'm not going to do that. I don't want to go into about uh, uh, her. Uh, I sat next to her in Parliament for three years, about six feet away from her. I never saw her speak once. I never saw her ask a question once. I didn't see her in Parliament more than a couple of times or once. Um, And then she became Prime Minister of the World. Uh, She's now got uh, a knighthood. She's Lady Ardern. And she's vanished into the ether, which is good. Which is good. So... We've moved on. We have a national act, New Zealand First Coalition Government. I want Lux, that's Luxon, the Prime Minister, to do well. I want David Seymour to do extraordinary well. And I want Winston Peters to excel because I care about this country and this country needs turning around, which brings me to a substantive statement, Whale. Yeah. 
It's not a matter of the policies you may or may not have that you may or may not want to introduce or you may or may not be thinking about for the forthcoming budget. It's about slowing down, stopping and turning around the civil service that's going to be the challenge. The civil service is still operating with immunity. It's still on fast track in the direction of oblivion. There seems to be no change in thinking at the top of the civil service. That's why the top of the civil service needs rooting out, including the police commissioner and the big bosses of the government department, all overpaid and mostly Labour supporters. See, I, I, I you know, think that when you take over uh, you know, running the government, you have a change of government, that we should do something similar to what happens in the United States, where all of the heads of departments or people who are responsible, like the Secretary of the Treasury or whatever, uh, are appointed by the incoming government, and the old ones are, are you know, gassed and given given the "Don't Come Monday" card. Um, and I would have thought, you know, that what the government should have done is said, "Look, guys, you might have got used to." Um, you know, spending uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars on diversity, equity and inclusion type policies. Well, well we're going to cancel all of that. Um, if you don't like that, well, you can get cancelled as well. Um, but just, just to give you an example of what's going to happen if you don't play ball with what the new direction of the government is, uh, you, you and you, you're all fired. See you later. And uh, and then that would just sharpen the focus of their concentration on doing the job they're supposed to be doing instead of all this womble stuff and woke stuff that they're doing. They're spending millions of dollars on changing signs and renaming things and all sorts of stuff like that. Uh, you know, it, it's just ridiculous that they think they can sit there and wait out this government so they can get their chosen government back in again. The best thing to do is exactly what you said, root them out, Get rid of the the near do wells and uh, and downsize the civil service back to what it was before uh, Labor got in. Well, let me give you two for instance, Whale, for your listeners, hundreds of thousands of people that are hanging off of every word this morning. Give me two. I'll give you two for instances. Goff, Shul Goff, who went to Parliament the same day as me in 1981, yeah. the worst. Mayor of Auckland we've ever had, including Bruce Hubbard. Even worse than Lynn Brown. Oh, Lynn Brown technically, technically, uh, as mayor, got things done. Uh, so I've got no critical uh, criticism of there. What he did in the Nati Fatu room and how he left the curtains is not my business. Yeah. But technically, he was quite good. Phil Goff. Auckland debt, Auckland City, wider Auckland, Auckland Council debt from $4.9 billion to $9.9 billion, that's $5 billion, in six years he was in office. He was promoted to the High Commissioner in London, and he's still, still sitting in Belgravia, hobnobbing it with royalty and everyone else, funded by and paid for by this National Party Coalition government. Why hasn't he been given a back of the aeroplane ticket home to New Zealand where he can go and milk his goats on his goat farm at South Auckland and Manurewa? Why doesn't they do that? The next one. The next Trevor one, Mallard should the do the same. Oh, absolutely. Mallard was the worst speaker in New Zealand's history, and that takes a lot of doing. It, it takes a lot of beating. You have to beat Jerry Wall, and he was pretty bad. And you were there when Jerry Wall was a speaker. Well, I, I was. I was. Jerry Wall was at least a decent human person. Yeah. Wall was a good man, notwithstanding his foibles and his speakership. But anyway, he's still over there hobnobbing it with the new Prime Minister of Ireland and uh, living the life of O'Reilly and he should be put on a plane and brought back. Why are we leaving these people over there in these hobnob positions when they don't think like us, they don't work like us, they don't have beliefs like us, and they're against us? Well, Winston's the foreign minister, and I imagine he's working very quickly to uh, find replacements and to give them that exact message because 
I know for a fact that Winston Peters does not like politicians becoming high commissioners or ambassadors. He believes that is a job for professional diplomats and not for um, you know journeyman politicians who are getting a reward for ending their you know, less than average political parliamentary career. Napoleon said, didn't he, words don't even move the leaves and the trees. <laughs> Pass me my sword. But <laughs> Winston this morning should send a missive to Gosh and to Mallard. You're on the London Heathrow flight in New Zealand, flight number one, out to Los Angeles tonight, and you'll be back in New Zealand for Easter. Yeah, I agree. Totally, especially with Mallard. So, <laughs> you see, you see, you see, Whale, these are the kind of resolute decisions that I want to see made. I am totally supportive of Lux, of Seymour, and of Winston. I want them to excel for the future of this country, not for me. My future is well past. But for my kids, your kids, and their kids, I want them to do really well. But we've actually got to get some runs on the board. We've got to make progress. There's nothing that will increase Lux's profile publicly and support out there amongst the chattering classes than to get runs on the board. Say to government departments, no more of this marification. Get on with representing us as equal New Zealanders, all together and one going forward as one. That's what they should do. And they should repeat these messages in volume over time. You cannot repeat serious messages enough. And you hear me doing it. You repeat important messages and statements loud, in volume, over time, continually. And so we've got to get that message out because I see New Zealand at the moment still in a state of flux. Yeah, There's a lot of balls in the air. These balls, as they come down for the government, need to be well-managed yeah. and we need to be well-focused. But I repeat what I said, uh, and in case your listeners have just tuned in as they get back from countdown supermarkets into their cars and turn on their wireless, I repeat what I said. We've got to slow down, stop, and turn around the civil service before we'll see real progress. Yeah, the civil service is actually a drag on the economy, and the economy is what is going to make New Zealand prosperous, uh, it's going to make people's lives better, it's what lifts people out of poverty. Welfare never lifts people out of poverty, it keeps them in poverty. Um, and so, you know, we need to have a government that's actually focused on the economy. And I noticed that Grant Robertson in his valedictory speech uh, um, mentioned that um, you know, if he had his time over again, he would have borrowed more. I mean, is this guy a moron or, or, or does he think that money grows let on trees? Stop, let me stop you there. Grant Robinson told us six years ago that we were going to have government spending within 30% of GDP. If we had have kept government spending within 30% of GDP for the last six years, instead of having an internal debt of $9 billion, we would today have a surplus of $5 billion. Yeah. So let's get that up on the record. Well, that is where we come. But I want to come back to some other geopolitical things that are really worrying me if I can seek leave to do that sure. well. Yeah, go for it. That is the Middle East and Ukraine. Let's start with Ukraine. I'm seriously worried about Ukraine. I'm a student of that war, that senseless, needless, hopeless, fruitless, worthless war. Yep. Uh, and I understand it. Uh, as you know, the battle lines are 1,500 kilometres long. That's the front line. 1,500 kilometres from North Cape to the Bluff. Yep. That's the battle lines. Uh, the Ukrainians now, all the tanks are just about gone, and they're sitting in trenches with Kalasia cloth guns yep. and hand grenades, uh, which, are, which are shared around, uh, and uh, you only get a certain number each day. I am seriously worried about the future of Europe vis-a-vis -vis the Russian-Ukraine war as of today going into Easter, the day after the special day in the life of Jesus. I'm seriously worried. I'm seriously worried uh, about that. I cannot see a victory for Ukraine 
which defaults to. I cannot see a victory for Europe, which defaults to. I cannot see a victory for the United States, which defaults to. I cannot see a victory for New Zealand in this Russian-Ukraine war. I'm very worried about it. So I want to park that for a sec. That's going to yeah. affect us economically. Economically, and this country is absolutely flat broke. I want to now come to the Middle East and October the 7th last year yep. uh, when a massacre took place. Of unprecedented. Uh, I, I haven't got words to describe it, but what I, what I can, how I can describe it is I can talk to you about the retaliation that's needed today. I'm a supporter of Netanyahu. Yep. I'm a supporter of Israel. I'm a supporter of their sovereignty. And I'm a supporter of them having out their right to live in peace for the rest of time. And if they don't take on the Hamas criminals in the tunnels under Rafa today, tomorrow, or at the latest after Easter next week, then it's going to be all over because the pressure of the world will bear upon them. They'll have to retreat and these criminals will take over Israel at a time yet to be judged. It's going to happen. These people have got to be eliminated. This Hamas crowd have got to be eliminated. And I've got a message for the Palestinian supporters. I don't have anything against a good human person wherever they come from. Yeah. But these people that are sympathizers, these people that live and work and presumably pay taxes in Aotearoa, New Zealand, if they don't like our policies, our foreign policy, and our support of Israel, they should f off back to where they came from. Yep, that's uh, fairly blunt. Um, but, you know, I tend to agree with you on that, uh, Banksy, because that's the thing, right? They've, they've got a right to freedom of speech by living in New Zealand. They can march down the street and chant whatever they like. But uh, they can't accuse Israel of genocide when they're chanting genocidal uh, chants themselves. So let's be perfectly honest here. The the chant from the river to the sea means the death of every Jew between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean exactly. Sea. That's what it means. Exactly. If, if you look at the and history the way, of all the countries around <laughs> Israel, right, if you look at Lebanon, how many Jews live in Lebanon? None. How many Jews live in Syria? None. How many Jews live in Jordan? None. How many Jews live in Egypt? About 100. How many Jews live in Saudi Arabia? About a hundred, right? So if they, if from the river to the sea, they want to cleanse uh, Israel of Jews, that is genocidal and that is a chant, and it is it is what Hamas believes in. We we need to nail this file this morning. Mm. That kind of rhetoric that. Narrative, that language has no place in this modern society of New Zealand. And it should be stamped out. And we don't hear it being stamped out. The elimination of the Jews. That's what the chant is. And it's wrong. It is so wrong. And we should say it's wrong. And if these people don't like New Zealand because of our foreign policy, fold your tents. Leave. Pack your bags, get them angry, get on a plane, and I'm sure we can get the government to help fund your airfare back to where you came from. That's the thing that, that I'm staggered about with people who come from, you know, countries that aren't democratic, where there is no right to the freedom of speech, there is no basically no human rights, uh, especially for women, especially for gay people, especially for, for anybody who doesn't fit the the monotheistic rules of Islam. There's none of that, but they come here and uh, and then they want to change New Zealand to be like where they came from. And nobody says anything. We go, oh, no, we've got to accept that because we're a multicultural society and uh, and we, we've got to be polite. And, and I actually believe that New Zealand needs to have a, a, a what I call a, a, a FIFO policy um, when it comes to immigration. That is fit in or F off. Please, please, don't get me on immigration. That's another subject. 137,000 new arrivals last year, most of them uneducated, most of them unwanted, 
all doing jobs that New Zealanders should be able to, could be able to easily do, and costing the country a fortune. So don't get me onto that. But I'll tell you what I want to put up the mask that people don't know. Wars are about money. If Russia had as poor amount of money as Ukraine, Russia wouldn't be fighting today. Ukraine wouldn't be at war if Ukraine had no money. Hamas wouldn't be fighting Israel if Hamas had no money. So let me tell you where the money is. Iran, mm-hmm. 225, million, 225 billion US dollars in cash. Which Iran, Biden gave them. Which, which Biden gave them. Well, well, we know that. Iraq, another sympathizer for these people, 265 billion US dollars in cash. Hamas are cashed up. Israel aren't. Hamas are. Yep. Ukraine isn't. Russia is. It's about money, whale. And if the money runs out, then the war stops and defeat is absolutely around the corner. So we have to be careful. So we've got, we've got fighting in the Middle East, which is affecting trade and the well-being and stability of the globe. We've yep. got fighting in Ukraine on the doorstep in Europe, which I can't see a winner. And we don't have the kind of leadership we need. I say, you know, we should really ramp up the arming of the Ukrainians and get stuck in and fight like we mean to fight and fight like we mean to win. We should really ramp up Israel and get them ready to go. And they should go into Rafa at least at the latest after, after Easter. And they need to take out these criminals. Because if not now, when? If not now, when, well, are we going to stop the criminals in Hamas, in the trenches, in the southern Gaza, uh, from doing what they're doing? They will come back and rape, torture, kill and murder young kids and elderly people in the future sometime soon. Yeah, I mean, you know, Blinken is saying to Netanyahu and so is uh, you know, Biden, I don't go into Rafa or else. Netanyahu is saying, sorry, you don't get to dictate how we fight a war. Uh, if we need to go into Rafa, we'll go into Rafa. Now, I, I've got a lot of contacts in Israel, and uh, October the 7th was a sea change. It was a step change away from the way Israel's previously dealt f- with things. Um, you know, in 2014, I was in Israel, and I was getting rocketed and everything out of Gaza you know, when I visited Starot and uh, and some of those, uh, you know, kibbutzes like Biri and and those places that were were invaded by Hamas on October the seventh. I've been there to those places. I've seen. You know, I was sitting there watching the videos that were coming out, and and I had to, I sat through a forty five minute, you know, um, presentation of the videos that were taken off the Hamas terrorists, and uh, it was appalling. It was galling. I was speechless for hours. Uh, after watching the most appalling crimes against humanity. And, um, you know, I sit there and I think, and I've been talking to these people in Israel and they're saying, no, we're not going to think that we're just going to, you know, put a fence around uh, and stop them coming in. We need to actually sort this out so it never happens again. And that's why the catch cry is uh, never again is right now. And there is a change in the Israeli mindset. They are not going to tolerate this anymore. And uh, they're going to remove Hamas as the government of uh, of Gaza. They're going to assist in the rebuild of Gaza. And they're going to ensure that there is a, uh, a government put in place in that area that is not uh, indoctrinating uh, uh, the citizens, is not... Uh, hijacking United Nations organizations like UNRWA, and uh, they've systematically got all of the information, all the data on UNRWA and all of the, the things that they've been doing in the schools and the health system and everything, and they're going to make sure it doesn't happen again. And and they don't care well, what the I, United States thinks, and they don't care what the UK thinks. They they care about their people. Well, wait, well, let's move it from that side of the world to this side of the world. Two questions, Whale. Yeah. Why is it that there are no other countries around Gaza that want to take these nice people? Why? The, Why? the Egyptians have got, you know, this is the thing that uh, we saw Douglas Murray uh, last week in an interview with the BBC, and the BBC interview was saying, oh, you know, Israel has a fence around Gaza. 
and they're not letting aid in. And he said to him, well, there's another country that has a fence around Gaza as well. It's Egypt. How come you don't mention them? And Egypt's fence is actually more intimidating than what the Israelis had. Uh, but nobody ever mentions uh, Egypt. They've got uh, uh, several tank battalions and troop battalions on the border of Gaza in Egypt, making sure no Palestinians come into Egypt. But nobody says anything about that. Well, well I wonder in this valuable time that we've got left today, we could turn our attention to the war at home. Yeah. The war at home. We do have a war at home. Uh, we have a war at home. And I want to start with the war on our traditional faith, uh, our beliefs, our spirituality, our values, and the morality of New Zealand Incorporated, which is under stress, uh, at war, within itself, and losing, and losing. We now live, Whale, in case you don't know, in a post-Christian, heathenistic society where anything goes, where there are no values, there are no principles, there's no right, there's no wrong, there is them, and there is us, and we are losing, and we are divided, and we are broke, and we're losing our sovereignty. Yeah. That's the war we need to fight at home, Whale. Do you understand I oh, know, I totally understand. I mean, you, you know, you and I grew up, you're a little bit older than me, obviously, but we grew up in a society where we had a true egalitarian New Zealand society where Jack was as good as his master. And, uh, you know, we had equality of opportunity in New Zealand and people could work hard and get ahead. They could buy a house. They could do all these things well, systematically over over the last 30 or 40 years. And I think it goes on, you know, maybe a bit longer than that. Systematically, those values have been eroded. We've got a, the bizarre situation where we have government organisations um, that are you know, taking political positions on things that shouldn't matter to them, like, for example, whether or not um, Arthur can decide to call himself Martha and we should go along with the delusion that, that Arthur is Martha. Uh, you know, back in your day, back in my day, we'd say, oh, don't be stupid, Arthur. <laughs> You know, but now we're told that we that that men can compete in women's uh, competitions in sport, and that's okay. Well, it, it's not okay. There's a reason for for, for having men and women's sports, and just because some bloke wears a frock and decides to call himself a girl's name doesn't make him a woman. You see, the moral fabric of the country has disintegrated. We have no direction driven by values and principles, doing the right thing and doing things right. We don't even teach it in the schools, whale. No. We can't we can't go back. I mean, I would think that seventy percent of New Zealanders would not understand the real significance day by day of Easter. They wouldn't know what yesterday was on the Christian calendar, and they mm. wouldn't care because we've now changed the kaleidoscope of New Zealand's egalitarian society where there's them and us, uh, them hate us, and hate uh, uh, us hate them, and it's divided, and on race lines in particular, but on faith lines more particular, where you and I, uh, uh, living in this post-Christian society, uh, in the minority, and you do as you're told and shut up. Yeah, but it's by design. This is what um, what I used to call creeping social creeping socialism, right? This, this is this is by design. Uh, it is a tactic that has been used over and over and over again of dividing society into silos, pitting one silo against the next silo. Uh, it's convenient because it keeps the masses. Uh, dis, uh, disheartened uh, and dispirited, and then they can't unite for a common goal. And uh, and we see the polarization, particularly in politics, where everything the Labour Party says is good and everything the National Party says is bad, or vice versa. The National Party is just as bad as the as the Labour Party when it comes to things like that. 
Um, but the left uh, have a resolve. Uh, they have a drive to control society that the right doesn't have or even the centre doesn't have, especially in the centre where there's a prevailing attitude of, of that we should go along to get along. And that is uh, ankle-tapping our society. It's ankle-tapping uh, our future. And it's giving in to the, uh, the, 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 the under the guise of diversity uh, uh, to a monoculture where everyone has to agree with what the state says. And this is why we see a prevalence of the state stepping into our society. Uh, we saw that during the pandemic. We saw the government uh, you know, telling healthy people to stay at home. We we told well, uh, we were told um, you know that you couldn't go to a restaurant unless you had a pass. Uh, you we were told that um, the unvaccinated were horrible people and they should be discriminated against. And then when you layer on well, the the racism and, and of of uh, you know Maori versus the rest, uh, layer that on top of it, you've got divisions in society where people are fighting each other. And all the politicians and those in control and the elites are rubbing their hands with glee, saying, yes, it's worked. Well, let me leave you with this, Whale, as I go out and earn some money and pay some tax so that yeah. people can live in a style that I'd like to become accustomed. Um, let me leave you with this thought. Um, people often say to me, oh, John, where, where, where did you get your energy from and why did you do this and how did you do that and whatever success you may have had, how do you attribute that and what happened to you? Uh, I, I just want to say and leave you with one thing, Whale, to think about. Firstly, thank God for the Salvation Army. If it wasn't for the Salvation Army that would pick me up on a Sunday morning and drive me 16 miles to Sunday school, provide us with jelly after Sunday school, and then drive us 16 miles back to where we lived. Yeah and taught us the difference between right and wrong and good and bad and evil and righteousness and doing the right thing and doing things right, I wouldn't be where I am today. So thank God for Sunday school. You're not going to hear this from any of your other interviewees <laughs> in, a, in a short time. What? Thank God for Sunday school. I'll start again. Thank God for Sunday school in a Christian church with a faith that belonged to the Salvation Army that took me there every Sunday as a kid. That's what I say. And I know it's hackneyed, and I know it's old-fashioned, and I know that there could be uh, a charge of treason or something else that could be laid against me in this post-Christian time, in this uh, you know, hedonistic country we live in, that, you know, we've got to get back to some very simple faith-based principles of how we should live and where we want to take the future. I agree with you. You know, I, I've been through some challenges in the past, you know, couple of years uh, or few years, you know, with a stroke and, and all sorts of other things. And you now I, every morning I wake up and I thank God that he's in my life. Um, makes a huge difference uh, to how I can cope with the challenges ahead and how I've coped with the challenges in the past. And I'm never going to resile from that. I'm never going to resile from my faith about uh, what I believe. And, um, and and I'll use every opportunity I can to tell people what the good news is. And you know, Easter is a perfect time for that. And you know, this show is, uh, you know, tomorrow morning people are going to be you know, waking up on Good Friday. And, and as you say, they, most New Zealanders won't even know what Good Friday is. But I do, and you do, and that's what's important. And and we tell people what that means, and we tell people what Easter Sunday means. So um, you know, I I still have hope for New Zealand. I have uh, a whole lot of uh, you know energy to see New Zealand become a better place. I, I'm totally opposed to polarization and div and and division and all of those things. I learned the evils of that the hard way. And uh, and and you know people like you and people like me can can make a difference as long as we keep talking. As soon as we go quiet, they win. Well, well, I leave you on this note. Uh, I salute you. Uh, you are the son of a king, and uh, you are living in the kingdom. And you're grateful. You're blessed. And uh, I just think about some of the great things that have happened to me in my life, and I'm very very grateful. And uh, one of them is knowing you and your family, and we're thinking of your father, 
uh, at this difficult time for him and his life. Uh, but uh, hey, uh, we're not fearful of the future. Talk soon, well. All right, thank you very much, Banksy. Appreciated you coming on the crunch again. Banksy is a great mate, and he's like watching Speedway. You know there's going to be crashes, but you don't know when. And with him, you know that he's going to say something, but you don't know what he's going to say. And I love having him on the show. Love him or loathe him, you're never going to die wondering what Banksy thinks. Tell me your thoughts about what Banksy had to say by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.